to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again. And today, we have another amazing show lined up for y'all. We have our special guest. His name is Mark Stephen Pearl. He is a native New Jersey guy, but we're going to learn everything about his amazing story. He has a powerful story. And man, who doesn't love the mom? I know I love my mom. And man, this guy right here, he really loves his mom. And he has an amazing website you should check out. It's a cup of tea on the commode.org. And today we're going to be talking about his amazing book. But before we even do that, let's welcome Mark to the show and say, first of all, how are you doing today? Hi, uh, very well. Uh, actually, I, I'm broadcasting from the south of France, and uh, today, unfortunately, we have very uh, London-like weather. It's cold and rainy, wow. but normally it's uh, 300 days of sunshine, so I can't complain. Well, I appreciate you making the time for us, and a little bit about you, if you will. Uh, share a little bit about yourself with our audience, because you didn't just write an amazing book, but you also have an amazing career as well. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about amazing. Thank you for that. But uh, So I grew up in New Jersey with, uh, there were six of us, uh, six kids. I'm the fifth out of the six. There's three boys, three girls. I'm the youngest son. And um, my parents were great. They're originally New Yorkers, and they moved to New Jersey. My dad was a chemist, so he worked for a couple of uh, uh, firms in uh, New Jersey. My mother was a full-time proofreader for uh, the Bergen Record, which at the time was the largest newspaper in New Jersey. And um, so uh, we had a great uh, upbringing in uh, Ridgewood, New Jersey, which is, uh, I guess, considered a suburb of New York City. It's about 20, 20 miles outside New York City. And depending on traffic, you, get, you can get there anywhere within a half hour or 20 hours. Um, but it was a, a, a great place because the, the village was, uh, they called the village of Ridgewood, it's very uh, a nice, very good education system and a, really a cool place to grow up. And then you, uh, short distance away, you had the center of culture and it was just uh, fantastic. So I got exposed to a lot of really cool things, especially the arts, which were and still are a big part of my life. And that was, um, I think, uh, attributed to my mother and her love of the arts. And uh, so that was uh, pretty cool. So that's it in a nutshell. I went to Ohio State and studied uh, industrial design. And then I caught the acting bug, I think, from uh, reliving some of my childhood uh, exposure to the arts. And I uh, went out to Hollywood for 28 years um, uh, and did the Hollywood thing, which I had uh, pretty good success for a while. And then as uh, time goes on, you age out unless you've got a really good career going. At that time, I had an okay career, but uh, things started slowing down. Uh, but while I was there... It was very inspirational. I think my parents kind of put this in us too, because we all worked as kids and we all owned our own companies eventually as we uh, got older. And uh, so one of my adventures was I invented a snack food or I started a snack food company with my brother to honor my dad and his half pop popcorn snack he invented in the early 60s. And it was kind of like a family secret. And uh, to honor him and his memory, because he passed before we were actually in the stores, um, we, uh, created this product, which we called the grandpa pose originals and it became a national brand for a while. It was the snack of the day on Rachel Ray. And, uh, it was a really good, fun, a lot of work. I built a nice factory out in LA and it was an organic snack and we were riding that new wave. And, uh, um, and then the, the subject of the book is, uh, in 2012, we got a call uh, from my brother who said my mother just shut down. She was living in the house we all grew up in, in Ridgewood. And she seemed to be somewhat depressed and wanted to check out. So uh, we all flew in and we were pretty much on death watch because her doctor cut off all meds and food and hospice was called. And um, usually when hospice is called, the end is uh, not such a happy one. So uh, that was a, a big deal. So that's how... Uh, the book opens with that call. And um, so I changed my life because I was a uh, 
At that time, I was 55 and I was a carefree bachelor living in LA, having a good time. No steady girlfriend, no children, never was married. Um, and my only obligations really was to my uh, business. And um, so this call kind of changed everything. And I flew back home and stayed with her for several weeks. And um, and then she snapped out of it, which was great. But I realized that she really wanted and needed, I think, love to be uh, in that house again, that we had some people that moved in that were overseeing the household duties and things and, and cooking and stuff for my mom. She could still walk and do things. But after this episode, uh, she was bedridden. And that was pretty much it. But once she snapped out of it, then I started thinking, okay, I need to do something because my mother deserves better. And um, and that's what the book's about. We're talking to our guest today, Mark Stephen Pearl, and his book, A Cup of Tea on the Commode. Talk about the call. Because when you started to rush to uh, back to New Jersey, and find yourself by your mom's bedside, caring for your mother. What was going through your mind? Were you just saying, boom, got to get up and go? How were you um, reacting to that call? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I grew up in a very uh, nurturing family, and uh, family was number one. So uh, 14 years earlier, I got a call, similar call, about my dad um, and my brother... Uh, the same same brother had to make those calls, which are not easy. And he said, dad has 30 days and I flew in the next day. Um, it's just what you, what I do anyway. And uh, with my mom, we didn't know how long it was going to be. And uh, so there's no question. You get on a plane and you go. And then once I got there, she was in a, I called it a semi comatose state. So she didn't open her eyes. Once in a while, she did open her eyes and looked at a the corner of the room, which was very interesting. And I have a chapter about that. Uh, but she didn't talk and she didn't really uh, acknowledge any of us other than she was very responsive to touch, which was nice. And so uh, one of us uh, slept in the bed with her uh, just to, to be close, just in case she needed something. And uh, my younger sister and I hung out with hospice. Hospice was there all the time. They were great. And, uh, but we wanted to care for our mother as much as possible. So we learned, we were really good students. We learned whatever we could to uh, learn how to change the diapers. And, and, and an adult, it's, everything's a little bit different. Uh, changing the bed while a helpless patient is lying in bed. Uh, certain techniques of uh, washing and, and how to care for a fragile older person. At this time, my mother was 89. She just turned 89. And, um, so it was it was good to do that. And I think my mom sensed that we were there. Um, and then when she snapped out of it, whenever hospice uh, hospice was there less and less, uh, my sister and I took over. And then when uh, my younger sister went back to Michigan to her family, I stayed on for a number of more weeks and took over. And uh, it was great because um uh, a little awkward, I think, because it's very rare for a son to take on the caregiving duties. And at that point, I wasn't 24-7. By the end of the year, I kind of did uh, fill that spot. And um, But it, it was uh, a little bit of an adjustment because you're seeing your mother for the first time, at least for me, naked. And you're seeing what all those years have done to her body. And... Um, this is where I think some of my design and acting experience came in because I assumed the role of the caregiver and, uh, and, and got over the, uh, the personal relationship as best I could and said, I've got a job to do. So I'm going to assume this role and do it as best as possible. But, you know, she's still my mother. I will ask permission for various things. And, um, when I did ask her if, if she wanted me to, to really move back and take over everything, uh, she said, yes. And I said, well, if I do that, two things. First of all, we will have fun. Second of all, that means I'm in charge. And her mood completely changed. <laughs> and then she puckered up for a kiss. She was, a, a, I called her a, a little bit of a kissing bandit. And I wasn't sure if that uh, puckering up was a sign of surrender or one wishing me luck. And uh, so I gave her a kiss and hoped for the best because she, she could be a tough cookie. And with the the knowledge of understanding that you became uh, 
your mother's primary caregiver. And you just mentioned getting her a blessing to be the one to step up for the challenge and be with her. What was it like to have that balance between being the one in charge to oversee her care, but also maintaining respect for the dignity of your mom? Um, I don't know. I think for me, it was pretty easy because uh, she is at that point pretty much a child and completely dependent on whoever was uh, in the room caring for her. Um, and she seemed to be quite content with whoever, because uh, unlike my dad, my dad wanted to maintain his dignity until the end and um, uh, and rarely asked for help. Uh, we knew when he needed it and we would jump in. But with my mom, she was like, uh, you know, she was almost like the queen. Go ahead, take care of it. You're now my servant. So uh, that was a little uh, interesting. And sometimes uh, she took it a little too far. Uh, but usually she had a good sense of humor. My dad did as well. And I luckily uh, inherited some of those genes. So um, humor played a, a major role in it. Um, but I think with with that role, even if it's not your mother, um, uh, maintaining that respect for that person and and if if not maintaining their dignity, uh, restoring their dignity, because at that point, I think my mother lost some of her dignity. So I did some things to boost her spirits. Uh, one of the first things I did is I bought her a new wardrobe because these old day dresses and were tattered and they looked like old person's clothes. And I didn't want my mom looking like that. I wanted her to look her best and feel her best. Um, and then... Um, uh, that was a, a, an awkward thing for a middle-aged man going out looking for uh, uh, senior citizens clothing and stuff. That was kind of fun. Um, uh, but then I also created a thing called Day of Beauty. And um, my mother worked full time and had six kids, but she treated herself once a week to a uh, the beauty parlor where she got a, um, a shampoo and set and had her nails done. She had gorgeous nails. She was a nail model in her late 20s, early 20s, or late um, teens, early 20s. She had gorgeous nails. So she always took care of those, which were a miracle uh, raising six kids. Um, so I wanted to uh, recreate that for her at home because I don't know the last time she went to the beauty parlor or was ever really cared for, uh, uh, treated like a, a beautiful woman. And um, so I would, uh, uh, when she was sitting on the commode, I would soak her feet in Epsom salts. I would wash and sham shampoo and, and uh, rinse her hair. Um, and then she got a full body massage with uh, lotion and then I tended to any medical needs she needed. And then she picked out her wardrobe and then I blow dried her hair and ponytailed it or sometimes even gave it a braid. Uh, and then I did her nails and, um, and then finished it off with some nice bright, bright red lipstick to match her nails. And uh, I didn't think that much of it. I just thought this is something she would like. And um, and then the first day I did it, I was wheeling her from at that point again, she was uh, bedridden. So I would carry her into the, uh, the wheelchair and then take her into the uh, kitchen for breakfast. We had a large dining room table. I mean, a mirror in the dining room. And I parked her in front of that and she just beamed. And I leaned in to uh, cheek to cheek with her. And I said, uh, who is that pretty girl? And she smiled and it was just gorgeous. The, the, the the effect on her and certainly on me as well was just profound. And then um, so I kept doing this with her because everybody, it, it, her, her, her excitement and, and contentment with this thing, I think, just kind of radiated. So whoever saw her after that said, oh, my gosh, you look great. And, the, and the, so the wardrobe and the day of beauty had a huge impact. And so I, I maintained that the the. the um, our journey, I say, lasted three and a half years. And so uh, uh, I, I kept this up because of the uh, just the beautiful effect it had on her. When you look back, what lessons do you believe you learned about the importance of the small gestures that you created with acts of kindness and providing her the best care possible while you had the time left with her? Well, I have to say, uh, because at that point, not having children and not being married and stuff, uh, unconditional love was something I was probably still grappling with. Um, 
So I definitely learned unconditional love because it was uh, my my mo at that time was I would I would do things I would jump in with full gusto and then get bored or accomplish what I wanted to accomplish and then and then move on to the next thing. Well, with my mother, I was not moving on until she wanted to move on. So I had to learn. Uh, no matter what uh, the, the 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 mental, physical, or emotional stress you're going through, uh, it's it's the job that I took on, and so um, I not only had to um, uh, make sure mom trusted me, but I had five siblings that I had to deal with that uh, allowed me to take this on. So I didn't want to disappoint anybody. Um, so definitely, unconditional love was something I learned, and patience. And uh, being a parent, boy, there's times where, you, you know, you just love them to death. And there's other times where you, 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 want, you want to kill them because they can be stubborn and a, just a, a real pain in the neck. And my mother was very independent and, um, and uh, she was a guilt tripper, and, but, but funny. Um, so I had to deal with all that stuff. And there was times where, you know, I, I, it wasn't a perfect thing. I blew my top occasionally and, uh, and, um, but you get over it. And luckily she was very forgiving. Uh, but I'd say probably the main thing for me was empathy. And I think for anybody in that uh, position, because you really have to put yourself in their shoes. Um, they are still um, a person. They still deserve respect and dignity. Uh, they have a lot of wisdom and they deserve love. And if, um, Another thing that I learned is is wanting to feel pretty doesn't end at 90 years old. And um, if if you really tune into what you think they need, and then also, also you can ask, there's a nice dialogue going on. You ask, hey, would you like to have your hair washed today? Would you like some makeup? Uh, it, it, it was it just a, a very cool, um, uh, I think, time that we had together. And a lot of that came out of how I was raised. And um, so it, it, it didn't seem to be that big of a deal. I mean, it ended up being a, a lovely uh, experience, certainly for me. And then when I shared my story early on uh, with other friends who were going through this, because especially as baby boomers, we're all dealing with this. And it's a phenomenon that's just going to get uh, worse and worse or better and better, depending on how you um, look at it, because we're all living longer. And um uh, this is going to become a crisis if we don't handle it the right way. And I'm hoping to inspire other people to handle it the way I did um, because it was rewarding for me, certainly rewarding for my mom and for my siblings. And then as I shared my story, people really got some uh, inspiration and some tips because it's, I don't say it's a how-to book because it is a memoir with some lovely stories, but um, it's a what I did book. And there are some, I think, some really good tips in there that people have certainly benefited from. Um, and, uh, you know, when I see my mom and the look on her face, even in those very frustrating days, when you see her smile or pucker up for a kiss or give me a witty uh, comeback uh, to something I said, it, it was that's that's all the, I think, payback or, or, or joy you needed to know that you're doing the right thing. And um, yeah, so it was, I think, it might have been more rewarding for me than it was for my mom. We're talking to Mark Stephen Pearl and about his mom in the book that he wrote in honor of her. A cup of tea on the org is the website you can go to. When you see through the lens of your mother, the role is reversed. At one point in time, she took care of you. And then at another set of time, you start to take care of her. What is something that you appreciate the most during the process of learning of the power of just being there with your mom, knowing that she knows that you haven't forgotten her? Well, there was... Um I guess one incident that kind of brings that uh, uh, into focus. Uh, there was uh, one day we really had a tough time. She had a tough time and I, had, I got very frustrated with her. And she looked at me and she's, she said, why are you so good to me? And I said, because you're my mother and you deserve to be loved. And it's an honor for a son to take care of his mother. And she was shocked. And she said, it is? And I had to, I had to convince her. 
that this was very important because, you know, I did say, you know, how long did you take care of us? I mean, it's 18 years, sometimes a lot longer, but for all of us, we all left, uh, you know, to go to college at 18. So that was it. But my gosh, it, it, it did take some convincing because she actually felt guilty. And uh, it, it hurt me that she felt guilty. So after I convinced her, and certainly by my actions convinced her, it was, um, it, it, I think was the, it, it was like, let's say the realization of the complete uh, role reversal. And, you know, you, you accept your parents, I guess, whether you like it or not, they're your parents and you accept that they are in charge or they should be for a certain period of time. And, uh, and she kind of let me take over at that point. And so that was a, a that was a very important moment. People listen to this right now, and maybe they are finding themselves or someone that they know unexpectedly thrust into the role of becoming a caregiver for their aging parent. Based on your experience, what words of wisdom would you give to that person in order for them to see the bigger picture in the responsibility of taking care of their aging parent? Well, I think the, the the first thing and most important is is to be there. If um, and and in any role that you can, if you're present, that's lovely. Um, if you're present and actually doing some of the work, uh, not everybody is cut out for that. Uh, even in my own family, there were siblings that just were uh, hands off. They did other things to to help out uh, with the house and making. Uh, one sister did a lot of cooking. Uh, when she came to visit and she made uh, uh, blankets and brought brought little um, mother love, little stuffed toys, anything with an animal was was great. She was a big animal lover. And um, um, so take whatever role you're comfortable with, because if you're uncomfortable, they will sense that, you know. And then I was fortunate to have uh, hospice there for a number of months. And I learned from the pros as best I could. So there are certain things, if you're going to take on more, learn how to do it correctly. Because if, uh, if, you, if you go in and you're not ready or trained, it'll be frustrating for both of you and also could be dangerous for your loved ones. So um, I would say that that is probably the most important thing. But if you're just there, I mean, some of the, the best moments that we had was just sitting at the kitchen table holding hands, um, not saying a word. Uh, she had the gift of gab most of her life, but uh, on these last few years, she had very little things, uh, didn't say a lot, but she, uh, like I said earlier, she responded to touch. And those were beautiful moments because you knew there was a lot of love going on between those hands. Um, so I would say, it, I, I hope that answers your question, but, you know, being there, I think is the most important and then take as much responsibility on as you feel comfortable doing. And certainly qualified to be doing so. Last question for you. We mentioned uh, hospice. With their experience, what would you say is a good balance to allow them to do their part, but know when is the right time to step up, step in, and kind of intervene, if you will, to make sure that the quality of the care is being executed? Well, if you, I mean, we we were lucky. Uh, I think all of the hospice nurses were 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 quite good, and all they they do are uh, they do uh, do their own thing. Um, we had a number of them that broke the rules because at that point, mom was off meds, off food. Uh, they said give ice chips if she needs a little moisture on her lips, uh, but that's it. And um, we had one hospice nurse that uh, there was a directive. We didn't do this, but my uh, younger sister and I were there all the time when hospice was there. And we never uh, stepped in uh, to do anything that they were supposed to do. We, we, we observed and learned what we could. And we asked. They, were, they seemed to be happy that we were interested and wanted to learn. So not one of them said anything like, you know, get out of my way. I've got work to do. They were all very helpful. And, um, but this one nurse uh, looked at the directive that said no food, no, you know, uh, no uh, drinks and no, no getting out of bed and stuff like that. And she went right into my mother and asked her if she was hungry. Now, my mother's eyes were closed for several weeks. Her eyes 
shot open like the dinner, dinner bell rang. And then this nurse accused us of trying to steal, uh, starve our mother to death, which I think in some cases may happen, you know, with the kids. But we loved our mother. We certainly weren't. We were listening to the hospice rules. So hospice doesn't always get it right. Um, so at that point, we, I certainly felt really guilty. And, uh, and after we had to get that nurse uh, out of the house because her supervisor even said, you broke the rules, you need to leave. So before they sent another nurse in, I went and asked my mom if she was in fact hungry. And she said, well, what do you got? And this is, uh, again, her first words in weeks. And I said, anything you want. At this point, it was March. So it, it had been about maybe three or four weeks since she uh, had any food. And she said, how about some pumpkin pie? And I said, well, okay, it's March. It's not really pumpkin pie season. But my brother who lived locally was in the living room and I asked him to go out and take a look. So he took on the uh, challenge and he came back with two pumpkin pies. And those pumpkin pies were like miracle workers. Um, the, she, she woke right up and she downed half the pie the first day, downed the half a pie the second day, and then a full pie the next day. But, and, and she snapped out of it and that, that she, she was back and she recognized all of us. And I think uh, we were off to the races because she's like, okay, my kids are here. Life is good again. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be here for a while, which was great. So, um, not everybody follows the rules. And in this case, uh, this particular nurse actually did us a favor. Once again, you listen on Refocus Radio talking to our guest, Mark Stephen Pearl. You can get his book, A Cup of Tea on the Commode. You can go to his website, a cup of tea on the org. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for what you did for your mom. I think that's commendable. I think that's powerful. And it says a lot about your heart. And hopefully someone listening will be inspired to do the same for their parents. Once again, I want to say thank you, Mark, for your time. I appreciate it, Shamaya. Thank you very much. It was a great to, uh, every time I get to share my mom's story, I keep her in the present, which is a, a, a beautiful gift for me. So I, I, I very much appreciate it. 